Culture is not just about the past. Although a lot of time we look at a museum, we look at artifact, we think about the past. It's up to the young people to interpret what the past means to them. Museum 2050 is a academic conference platform that me and my partner Lee founded and it really has a two-pronged approach to what we're trying to do in China or in the greater China region and that's provide a community for young museum professionals to come together and be a resource for each other but also a platform where young museum academics from all over the world can share their research with one another. Museums are the place where art meets the public. They're the places where connections are formed between, between people and objects, but also increasingly, I think, between people and each other. And in particular in China, they're fascinating because China is in the middle of what they call the museum boom. Uh, you have a very affluent middle class in China, and they want to consume cultural products. The problem or the interesting challenge in China is people are not socialized into museum going in the same way as they are in the West. So how do museums compete against other cultural spaces that are developing? You can't just take what's done in a Western context and just parachute it in. But they have to adapt. They have to adapt to the local climate. They have to adapt to the people. They have to adapt to the technology. Oftentimes things are happening so quickly here that there's a bit of a time lag in terms of getting it into publications, getting it into symposiums and exhibitions, certainly those outside of China, but even here within China. I think it's really important to discuss these issues and also to make other people within the community aware of them. One of the challenges, but an interesting challenge, is how the Chinese museum is going to navigate the global landscape of museums where the word museum has a different implication in China than it does necessarily in the West. The Chinese Museum, in some cases, is not a nonprofit institution. It's not a permanent institution. And it may have a business oriented and more commercial approach. Well, there's two things in the Chinese museums that make them very different from museums in other places in the world. And these are actually two very banal or uh, obvious uh, things almost. One is uh, they're very new, and two is they're very big. Because you see that actually the art in China is actually bigger in size and in gestures than in many places around the world. And it's basically driven by the fact that artists have big studios, big spaces where they work in. And also the museums are very big, so there's the possibility to display big stuff which sounds very uh, yeah, uh, simple, but it's actually, um, uh, it might have a huge impact on contemporary art itself, actually. Na全球化就是我觉得意味着就是大家找到共性。那未来我觉得就是找个性的这么一个时代。所以我觉得。应该是会越来越展现更多的关于中国艺术家、中国美术馆自己对于艺术的态度，所以我觉得还是应该是很大的一个很积极、很很很积极，还还还是很有前景的。我觉得。Very often, it's you're not becoming international by importing. You're becoming international when you're exporting. When you start ex exporting attitudes, when people are quoting you. When suddenly people want to be like you, then you're proving yourself. Chinese institutions are being challenged. Suddenly they have the attention. And if you have the attention, you have the momentum. And you can play the momentum in different ways. International interest for Chinese museum, I think right now is really, is kind of this novelty. But over time, I think that will develop into a deeper relationship in terms of co-creating co-presenting and taking some of that co-creation back outside of China. I think one of the biggest problems when it comes to institutions globally is that they look very much the same. They talk the same, they act the same, they have the same shows, etc., etc. If China dares 
to go its own way. I think Chinese institutions can play, play a vital role. You know, the institutional landscape is not just purely rosy in China. There are big challenges. And what's happening is that as people face these various challenges, some are responding in really interesting, creative ways and will find a way to survive and some will fail. But either way, this whole process here is how you reach a new synthesis about what a museum is and what it should be. So I think that this government uh And you know culture is if you let it grow, it's almost like a wave. It has a power. So everyone can hear me. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lee and Nicole, for actually giving us the chance to have this conversation. Thank you, Alice, for giving us also the opportunity to do it here in Hong Kong today. Um, my name is Ying. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong. I'm an architect. I research actually the relationship between art institutions, um, but the larger art ecology in relation uh, to the city, in particular cities in Asia. So my role today is actually to get the conversation going and uh, um, allow our panelists to speak a little bit about, um, do we have to? That's the question, right? Um, but firstly, I would like to introduce them to you. I'm sure most of you know, um, or at least are familiar with, the faces we have on the front panel. I'll start. So I won't say too much. I'll give one sentence. and. Um, of course, I allow the speakers each to say something perhaps about themselves. So I'll start on my right with P. Lee. Dr. P. Lee, um, as many of you probably know, is a senior, uh, SIG senior curator at the Unplus Museum of Visual Culture in Hong Kong. So, P. Lee, would you like to say just a, a few sentences about yourself? Yes, um, I'm SIG senior curator for the Unplus, um, the museum which will top in the building, top in the building next week, and we're open 2020, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm maybe uh, working on the, the visual art and Chinese art there. Thank you. And then we have on my immediate right is Tobias. Tobias Berger um, is the head of arts at Taikun, the new art and heritage revitalization project at the former Central Police Station in Hong Kong. So T Tobias. Yeah, um, I'm Tobias Berger. Yeah, um, we have. Yeah, I'm working at um, Daigun Contemporary, and um, we actually. It's like, um, do we have to collaborate? And we actually have to collaborate. It's in our <laughs> stages, and I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, but I, before that, I have actually worked with Pili at M Plus and at Parasite, so it's natural for me to to collaborate. And I think it's a great thing in Hong Kong. Wonderful. So we I already get a snippet. To my left um, is John Tain, who is the head of research at the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. John. Um, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just uh, happy to be here. And uh, thank you to Nicole and Lee for organizing this and inviting us to have this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, John. And last but not least, Alice. Uh, I probably shouldn't. I don't need to introduce Alice, but I will just say that Alice is the executive director of Asia Society. And Welcome, all of you. Um, I'm delighted to see such a great turnout on a rainy Sunday. Um, we've had conferences like this. I see uh, uh, Adriana there last week was uh, uh, Hong Kong Arts Gallery Association, and, and yesterday was, um, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, I think Lewis was here uh, talking about Xiji. So we at Asia Society, we collaborate um, all the time, and that is part of our DNA. So we're really delighted. And I see Josephine there from uh, Asian um, uh, Arts uh, ACC. So I'm really delighted that um, we, I 
was very honored uh, when um, uh, Nicole and Ta uh, Lee invited me to be part of this uh, uh, the conference in uh, just a few months ago. And so to see the, the fruit of the product uh, in this book, I'm really, really glad. When she asked, I definitely said yes. So look forward to future collaboration with all of you. Thank you all for the short introductions. Um, so I think the large central question that we're discussing here is, do we need to collaborate, right? But maybe to frame it a little more specifically, since we are in Hong Kong today and all of you represent different institutions of a particular nature in Hong Kong, um, also in relation to the book, which is about the future of museums in this part of the world, perhaps each of you can talk a little bit about the institutional roles um, of each of your institutions, um, in particular in Hong Kong, and also um, your relationships, um, perhaps to each other in, in um, the, special, uh, the specializations, responsibilities, and perhaps collaboration itself. Um, okay, um, I'm working for um, M Plus, and uh, as many of you may already know, M Plus uh, is a visual culture museum which will open 2020. And since two years ago, we have a small space called Art Pavilion, which is right on the, on the side of the West Kowloon Culture Park there. Um, so, compared with Asia so, so Society, compared with the Asian Art Archive, and the Dai, Dai, Dai Guan, I think the major Differences for M plus is that we have collection and we are a proper museum with our collection which cover the visual arts, moving image, architecture, design, public culture. So that's give us a very give we our museums have very special fun, fun function besides of the pro, pro program. Our major work will be like a keep and, and the re, re, re research on this culture heritage. We keep the history for tomorrow. So that, that's we functional like a contemporary visual culture museum here. Yeah, so yeah, let's start with that. Um, yeah, um, many of you have hopefully visited Daigun by now. And um, we are, from the beginning on, it was clearly said to us from the jockey clubs that we have to collaborate and that actually most of the programs that are happening at Daigun, the performing arts and the heritage and so on, are co-productions with other institutions. Um, for art, it's even a little bit more complicated. We are, um, we are operating in a so-called presenter model, which means that every exhibition we are doing, we have to do with another institution. We, ourselves, our, my curatorial team, is not allowed to curate our own exhibitions. That means that every time we have to invite um, another institution, which can be uh, locally, like Hong Kong, we had Spring Workshop, we had the universities, but can be also from China, and like UCC now, or it can be International Museum, is coming to Hong Kong to make an exhibition. However, for me, it is very important that each exhibition is tailor-made for Hong Kong discourse. Um, that means we are not, we are, I always say we are not a pit stop for a traveling exhibition because that makes absolutely no sense, I think. Um, we are, and I think we have also proven now, I mean the first show was with, one was one um, young artist with a, a university together, one was one with Spring Workshop, now we have two open calls, two young curator um, organizations as well as UCCA. Um, so we have, we have and it is a very, I mean, that's why do we have to, is a kind of provocative for me because it is a lot of work to, to collaborate and a lot of time I'm like, oh my gosh, again. But then there's also a lot of joy and I think our, our program also proves that we can be, can be very versatile and can, can do very different things, which is I think quite unusual for a smaller art center like we are. Yeah, so I think um, on the question of collaboration, I think maybe one thing that differentiates uh, Asia Art Archive and maybe Asia Society from an institution like um, M Plus and perhaps Daigun uh, in terms of its public is that we also exist to serve a public, but that public is um, conceived in a some slightly different fashion. So, you know, uh, when Asia Art Archive was created, it was really to be a resource for 
researchers as well and working professionals. And so I think within the DNA of the organization, there is this notion that we will be working with our peers. Um, and so I think from the very beginning, Asia Archive has worked with other organizations, you know, both in terms of providing uh, research materials and research um, specialization and consultation, but also just working with them and organizing uh, programs. So I think one of the first uh, conferences they organized, in fact, the very first conferences were collaborations with other museums so, or other organizations, Parasite, um, but also MoMA in New York. So it's kind of, you know, always been part of what um, A has done. And just yesterday, uh, my colleague Oske, who's here, um, organized the uh, Wikipedia session that was done with M Plus. So it's something that we continue to do. It's interesting. Um, I said we, we love collaborations, but I thinking back seven years ago when I came back, we were getting ready to open. Um, we've done about 20 exhibitions now uh, since we opened. Several of them that we've done it in the uh, Jockey Club Hall. Most of it in our Chantel Miller Gallery. I have to say. Uh, we really don't have to, uh, I think, because our luxury is that uh, we don't get funding from the government. We're not an LCSD museum. Uh, thanks to the Jockey Club support, we, which we have applied to, we've, we've chosen to collaborate. So I think from day one, the first two shows that we did uh, came from New York. And so those of you who know Asia Society uh, know that we're part of this 14 center network. It's 14 now. About a month ago, Japan came online. Uh, and then, but the idea, my understanding, and because I uh, um, was in New York uh, for nine years before coming back, the idea of this center when we opened was that it, it kind of like the Guggenheim model. That what they want to do was travel. Uh, a show that starts in Asia Society in New York, comes here, goes to Houston. Houston also has a museum space, a gallery space. Uh, Asia Society Museum has a collection. Uh, the, the, they started with the Rockefeller, wonderful Rockefeller collection. And then in recent years, they've also collected contemporary art. Um, I think under Melissa Chu, um, uh, for a while there, video art was really, and so we, they have a very nice contemporary Asian art collection. So the idea was that we would, the, the, you know, there would be a committee from all three centers, Houston, Hong Kong, and uh, New York, and the show would travel all three places. Uh, and the Rockefeller, our first exhibition, uh, uh, Buddhism and Art, that came, half of the exhibition came from, uh, half of the collection was the Buddhism from the Rockefeller and um, contemporary art. And that show did really well. But the second show that came from New York totally bombed. Mm -hmm. It was Indian Jewelry, those of you who remember. Uh, that show, Lock, Stock, and Barrel came from New York. And because it had done very well in New York for seven, uh, in, in the US, they just thought, we have Indians here. Gold jewelry, it would do well. <laughs> and so that's what I said. Don't, you can't bring things. Even Asia Society makes mistakes. I think all institutions. So for us, in the seven years, we learn about collaboration. We want to collaborate. And not just with New York or, or all the institutions in, in the West, but also local institutions. That's why, for me, for us, it's really interesting to see the development of local institutions, whether it's in China, or other parts of Asia, because that, to me, to us, is the exciting thing. It's, it's, we don't know what, where it's going to take us. And there are times uh, people ask us, can you do this? And I often said, why not? Our board is very supportive, long as we can find funding for it. So the key for us has been funding. Uh, if we can find collaboration to do, uh, to do an exhibition that's really, and so some of the show, going back to what uh, uh, Tobias has said, we, we have done shows that we collaborate with other, uh, we have co-curated, and my proudest exhibition has been our breathing space, um, the Chinese, uh, the Hong Kong contemporary art show that we did uh, last year, and that was curated by our own uh, curatorial team. So we can do. So the, the beauty of us is, we can do anything we want, <laughs> short of uh, short of money. <laughs> so that's a great lead into my actually second question because we have a panel. Um, of experts actually who have come to Hong Kong from all over, literally. Um, I think amongst us we have a few languages going. So perhaps each of you can talk a little bit about um, the role of knowledge, knowledge exchanging itself um, in the collaborative nature. Um, I think Alice already spoke a little bit about kind of this transplantation, um, especially in terms of Asia society as a body here in relation, but perhaps um, 
Becky Lee and John Tobias and also John from where you have worked um, and have had experience. You can talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess that, you know, um, the question of transplantation of knowledge or expertise, I think, is what you're asking about. I mean, so for people who don't know, uh, I am relatively new, newer to Hong Kong anyway than everyone else here. Um, so I've been here about a year. I started at Asia Archive uh, in October of last year. And um, I, can't, I come to Hong Kong from uh, Los Angeles where I had been a curator at the Getty Research Institute. And part of why I came here was because I had had that professional history at the uh, GRI, but also I think was really excited to by the opportunity of working here. And I think it was kind of um, part of uh, the experience of working at Asia Archive is bringing the experience that I have had working within a much larger organization. The Getty as a whole employs 1,500 people. They're about somewhere. Um, and the Research Institute alone is 200 people. So now I'm working on an organization which in Asia or certainly in Hong Kong is large with, I think we have about 40 people. Um, but for me, it's actually very, very intimate. Um, so it's part of it is bringing that knowledge that I have, but then part of it is also learning from this context and this situation um, and thinking about you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And one of the things maybe that um, is interesting in the in relation to this panel is that you know in Los Angeles it was always very very common for people from different organizations to say oh we want to work together with our peers so you know the Hammer or Mocha or LACMA you know we want to work together but in fact most of the time people don't do that um, and I think most people in most institutions in other cities don't really do that either because they don't have time or they don't have the proper resources and one of the things that's really been interesting about Hong Kong is without necessarily forcing it to happen, like in Los Angeles with the Getty Foundation doing Pacific Standard Time and kind of you know, offering funding, and that creates a kind of collaborative um, opportunities. Here, people just do it as a matter of course, and that's been actually very pleasant for me. And that's a learning experience for me, not something that I'm bringing. Um, I, I think from when, when I, I started out, um, I was still studying in the 90s, um, there, was, there was this crazy, almost crazy movement from Asia and um, Eastern Europe to America and to London and so on to study. And a lot of these people went then back right, into the countries. And that was probably the biggest knowledge transfer. And that's why this globalization, I think, of the art world could happen so quickly, like in, in a decade, basically, or in two decades. Um, and it was really about building up networks and the other. And then what happened, there were also these conferences in the end 90s, beginning 2000s, about alternative art spaces. Um, when Pili did the, the exhibition in Guangzhou, there were some conferences in Korea, and so on. So it was, it was more network building, and it was not so much about the institution. I think it was more about peop individual people that traveled a lot, that met at conferences at the Guangzhou Biennial in, in certain curatorial courses and so on. It, so it's not so much, uh, from the beginning on, it was not so much um, institutional driven. And then, um, same as John, when you then come to Hong Kong, Hong Kong, um, is, it is, there's not a lot of competition between the organizations. There was always um, a very good relationship between Parasite and AAA. There was also a very good relationship between um, um, one A video touch artist commune. Um, Claire and I then founded something called October Contemporary, which nobody remembers anymore. <laughs> but in, in the beginning, um, that was for three or four years. Every October, we made one program to get one. We had one topic, and everybody could do their own program on that topic. But it was also the, the main idea is actually to get together and talk and 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 um, cooperate in in a very informal way because we were all certainly AA and Parasite. And one a, a very different organization in now Dagoon and, and then plus. But the people, I mean, we see, I, I think I see John more than I see my wife. So it's like, <laughs> um, so, so it, it, but that, that, that's the nice thing about Hong Kong. It's, it's a village. It's not as huge as New York or Paris or Berlin. This is, a, we are in, living in this wonderful small village with amazing institution, all the great galleries here. And, and that makes communication and collaboration, I think, much easier than in other places. Yes, I have been here for almost seven years. Before that, I worked 
in Beijing. Uh, in as um, in the same time when I was the teacher at the Central Academy, the Central Academy of Fine Arts, I also opened a gallery called Bruce Lee Gallery in two thousand six. So today, when I see the doc documentary film, I just found it's quite interesting that the whole topic of the art ecology have totally been changed in the last six years. When we get, when we act as young as you you are, we get in the world, we are really used to, because I don't have no cultural infrastructure there. We are only can use the commercial gallery as the way to support in art. So collaboration became very important for us. So as you can see in Beijing, in Chaochang, in 798, all the commercial gallery become a cluster. So they can share the infrastructure, they share the clients, or, or more time they share the audience, and then they have, have to become the, the communities. So I, 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 I think that's a very important experience for me, that uh, because contemporary art is very fragile still in China, and even in many of the places. So, to run in such a fragile stuff, we really have to call, to be collaborate. We really have to like uh, communicate. We have to share the, the some of the, the, the resources. Um, another experience, but I just back from Shanghai, and, and we really see the booming of the mu the, the, the the museum there. But uh, on the other side, my question is about your, my experience last week in Shanghai. It's like, uh, do they really collaborate? My answer is no. Yeah, if I see such a, so many new buildings, the container for the content, but they don't have content. They have to compete for 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 content. On the other side, you, you can see a long museum or other places. They also have the same criteria of like a foreign blockbuster show there. You don't really, when I was there for a week, I really missed the cha, cha, Chinese art. I, I, I don't really see the diversity for the culture in, in for the culture in institution there. So that's my 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 experience. So after six years in Hong Kong and the M plus was a uh, only a plan, not become more and more real and the building is there. So that's also a great experience for us. And so I, I I think shall we collaboration? Shall we do collaboration? The answer is yes. But it's about how. I think each institution has to keep their uh, identity. But on the other side, when you talk about the co collaboration, the competition are, are still there. Competition makes us more strong. So I, I, I didn't feel that uh, and, until la, last two years when M plus become real and we start to fundraising. Uh, and we, we can see we, 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 with a such a big institution in Hong Kong, we, can, we still can see a lot of problem besides of the collaboration. I mean, like uh, for for example, like for the fund, fund, fundraising, people all tend to fund support the more big in, in institution with more wider public with more wider public access. On the other side, it's about the human resource. Like uh, such big institution could be wel the, uh, welcome to to get 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 get, get all young. Young like uh, the talent, so that's about within this kind of the reality how we collaborate. I, I think that, that should be make us be. It's not enough to have a good will, but we have to be clever. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, I think that that's really the idea of capacity building, which means um, educating pro professional profession people, professional educators, professional conservators, professional art historians. It, that's really what's missing. I mean we. We founded actually for that what we call a summer academy, where every year we get 20 people together for something like a post-grad um, workshop, two weeks. Um, I think Parasite now does uh, something. Uh, not they actually started eight years ago with a um, young curator conference. Um, but there's so much. I mean, there's so much to work on on, on exactly that on educating people um, to get that. You know, so they don't only have whatever, an, an, you know, a one-year course at one of the auction houses, but to kind of, you know, have a really good education. And again, it's not only art history; it's also conservators. Yeah. That's super missing. Um, um, yeah, um, educators are completely non-existent almost. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest challenge if you talk about collaboration. How do we manage to to get that education um, better? Um. I, I agree with everything they've said, and, and I, having been in New York nine years, uh, I think what John said about LA applies to New York as well. They all say they collaborate, and they said I said that to my colleague in Asia Society about lack of collaboration, and they were very offended. They said, "Well, we loan our work, <laughs> you know. I mean, because of Rockefeller Collection, they said we loan it, we collaborate. 
So it depends on what you mean by collaboration. I mean, so there is in LA uh, and, and New York, there's collaboration. But here, what I'm interested in is how do we, you know, what's really exciting to me is uh, I've also been back now seven years, and I was in New York nine years and 11 years in previous that in Hong Kong. Back then, there wasn't even really that many. Uh, and I think uh, Adriana can say that there was no, how many galleries were there in Hong Kong in the 90s, right? And, uh, and I think Kevin might be able to answer that. So, so I think if you look at the history, just in 20 years, just in the last 10 years, since Paley and I have been back seven years, the whole ecology of Hong Kong uh, in terms of art, um, art management, art collection, art and culture has just grown. And I think part of it is, is our Basel, part of it is also anticipation with uh, you know, West Kowloon and plus. So the exciting part about it, we, have an, we can write the book now on how we collaborate. Uh, we don't have to, and go back to the video I said, we don't have to follow New York or LA or Beijing or Shanghai's um, uh, idea of collaboration. Um, I look how young some of you are in here, and you guys now are collaborating all the time with technology. So that, to me, is the exciting part about Asia Society Hong Kong now. Uh, and, and one of the challenges I also have to echo is, so for us, it, it is definitely financial. I mean, there is competition. Uh, but the thing is, people are going to give, Uli is going to give Uli's a part of our Swiss Center, right? So you can't, the, the, the way I look at it is, you, you can't control who your uh, donor want to give. So you have to inspire them to be part of your um, network. But then, by working with them, they have also introduced us to institutions that are not in Hong Kong, uh, maybe in Europe, maybe in Japan. So, so for us right now, I feel Hong Kong can be the, we can rewrite the rules on collaboration for Asia. Uh, and then, because we don't have the, the baggage of some of the other cities, you know, whether it's Europe. So, but the human resource aspect, I also want us, and that's another reason I was so excited when Nicole, uh, because it's from the young people's perspective about how do you work in the museum field for the future. Uh, and so if we can help now and start growing, because right now our colleagues are being poached left and right. I have a colleague working in Taigun, former colleague. I have a I one. No, 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 but, but still, I don't, I, no, no, I, I just know, no, I'm excited. I know exactly where all my colleagues went. One is at Art Basel, one is over at, at, at West Kowloon, uh, and I think we have, like, we all have, again, going back to the donor. <laughs> yeah, one left you to come join us. Um, but, but I think part of it is how do you inspire them, going back to the donor, how do you inspire them to give? Uh, give their time and resources, but also how do you inspire them to stay and, and also help them pipeline the field. How many of you are going to be in this field uh, in 20, 10 or 20 years? Um, you know, uh, and, and some of us have been here longer. I'm not in the museum. I'm not in the art world. I love museums. Um, I stumble onto museum world. So, so, so that's the key to me right now is how do we do this new form of collaboration and, and attracting our donors with our program and also attracting talent to stay with us. And if they don't stay with us, how do you train them for the next, you know, for Asia, or Asia and globally? Because right now, having also seen it in New York, and you're here, like, where are the Asian curator? And they're coming up, but only just coming up, right? So, so that to me, going back to the, the other way, it's here, but also they need to go back and curate shows that are of blockbusters, and hopefully that's, that's where I see the, the, the future. I think that actually is um, a very good point, which is that, you know, not only Hong Kong, but Asia more generally, I think, is very young in terms of this field. And there's a lot of things that still can be worked out and developed. And really, the education is not just among the professionals, but also among the public even. Yeah, kind of, you know, experience. yeah, who, who are the publics and how do we reach out to them? I think that's part of the thing that all of us kind of confront and have to do have to, I think, and only makes sense to collaborate on in terms of working that. Yeah, I agree with all what you said. I just want to give you one or two examples. I think uh, as 
some speakers in the documentary said that this is a re the region not really have a proper museum or cultural institution, the culture. People, the cultural institution really have to compete with other uh, other spaces or uh, other um, uh, other other kind of the experience. So for us, like collaboration, not only in Hong Kong, but also in this region, like in Asian region, are extremely important. We have to all, um, the, all the collaboration can lead us to more bigger pub, public audience. And this whole audience very circular from Singapore to Taipei to Hong Kong to Shanghai to Beijing or, or to Indonesia. So that's a very, very, very important thing. And the second thing, as Tobias just ta 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 mentioned about is about uh, how we build up a kind of the base for the future collaboration, like a learning pro 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 program, conservation, and plus just signed a, a MOU with the power station in Shanghai. We have five years collaboration. But our collaboration, our, 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 I, I think by the museum opening in 2020, we sure we will tour our pro pro program to China, to 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 Shanghai up, up, after that. So before that, we committed to do some exchange program of the back of the house. We just we just exchange the re, re, registration team, conservation team. So we really can we feel safe that a certain work can travel around. I I think that that's very important um, for us to to collaborate. And and then with this kind of base, we can share the expenses to do the blockbuster. I think that as a, but, but without the, the, the kind of collaboration, the small collaboration, you cannot reach a big image of the collaboration. This is a, I want to turn the question around because I think all of you spoke about it, the audience, right? We have a room full of people who came on a rainy Sunday here to listen um, about the subject of contemporary art in institutions. Maybe each of you can talk about now the relationship of the institution, because the whole idea of museum um, is very much a product of modernity. It has to do with modernization, the public, an educated public. And I, coming from a higher education, am very curious about the roles of your collaborations. I think, uh, Tobias, you already spoke a little bit about this, about the necessity of building not only a public audience, and John as well, about the researchers, right? I mean, again, we are, we are in a very particular situation. Um, I'm basically overrun by people. I'm, um, I'm in, this, in this completely crazy situation where we are on weekdays, uh, on weekends we are on capacity, and we cannot, we basically have a line of people waiting to see a contemporary art show, which is rather unusual in, in the world. Um, but on the other side, um, all of our, not all, but I would say about, I mean, there are a few numbers. About 80% of our audience is from Hong Kong, which I think is fantastic. It's not expats, it's not tourists. Not that I don't like expats or tourists. I'm myself an expat. But um, it is, um, it is this, it really became that community Hong Kong Museum. Um, but the, the more interesting question is in our side that about, I would say also about 70, 80% of people who come to go to our museum are not prepared for an art, an art experience. They don't come. If you come here to the Okay, this is maybe extreme, but if you want to see the exhibition here, you have to climb up the wall, you have to climb up that mountain, then you have to pass that de con, um, that um, lobby desk and get looked at a bit strangely. Then you have to go up the stairs again, or you pass the Coke machine, and then you're somewhere in the rice fields to find it, which is certainly not their fault. It was just built that way. But um, so, but me, in my case, um, the people are just walking in because Herzog de Moron just built it like that, and most of them actually come because they have a nice. A, a, we have air condition. B, we have a nice staircase, and um, c, and C, it's really nice for Instagram. And um, um, but that's an amazing chance, right? That means for us, education is so in the core of everything. And we we had also we are still learning of how do I reach an audience that have have never been in a museum. And um, for example, we have made these really expensive, wonderful um, brochures. Every, you know, they're quite thick and very. They have a description about every artwork, and took us a lot of work and so on. And a lot of people picked them, picked the brochures up, but they didn't look into them. And I asked myself, why is that? And the reality is that most of the people who have never been in a museum don't know that art needs explanation 
or can have an explanation. We all know that, and for us, it's the most normal thing in the world to pick up, to look at the label and so on. So we now are doing wall text, which works much better, and wall texts are much easier written than the brochures and so on. We have, um, we have um, gallery guides that are super active, right? They are like, they talk to you. They don't stand in the, they don't stand in the, in the corner and are crumpy. They are very active and they really try to talk, to talk, to talk. And they are our best tool to communicate and educate. Because in the end, that's what um, we are doing. We are preparing also people to, A, we want that they come back, and we want that they then go to M+, and then that they go to the galleries and so on. We are really the entrance the entrance because of this attractive dagoon around us and um, because of, yeah, again, different reasons. And I think that one of my, my main challenges really to educate people for, to, to appreciate contemporary art. And, um, and this is, uh, we knew it a little bit before that could happen, but not with these numbers. And I'm, I'm quite happy that it works. I think um, one of the things that, uh, to follow up on that, is really interesting is about the mission of the different organizations. I think we, you know, each of us have uh, organizations that are there to work with the public and to develop the public. Um, one thing that, has, that struck me was um, the, in, the, in the film that we saw at the start, you know, the idea of museums like being for an audience that wants to consume culture. And I think that you know one of the things that maybe we're working against or kind of working and kind of trying to kind of um, adapt is this idea of that culture is something to be consumed. And I think the idea that art is also about knowledge production works in that sense that you know, we're trying to educate people, but also not just about art, but also how to have this kind of discursive relationship and have these kind of ex conversations with each other, right? I think that's a larger goal of um, cultural institutions. Um, and so I think that you know that kind of knowledge, how to do something, how to have these kinds of conversations, is also very important. Um, I want to address um, some of what Tobias complaints are. I totally agree. Uh, when you walk up here, you want to be up here. But one of the things that we also have to do um, is, uh, in fact, I don't know if you, you guys earlier we had a workshop down by the deck. So another of our responsibilities is really also educating. Um, it's and I often say we're educating um, the public for uh, M plus and for uh, Daigun. When you, I think contemporary art, well, art in general, I find in Hong Kong, people are intimidated. You know, I think many of you, some of us grew up going to museums. I grew up in the States. My first, uh, before I even went to the States, I've said, said this story before. Uh, I was born in Taiwan. Uh, my first museum was the Palace Museum. Uh, it was the grounds of the Palace Museum um, when I was five years old. So. So when you can get the kids excited about going to a museum when they're young, then they're going to go to a museum when they're older. They're not going to be intimidated. But in Hong Kong, I find that uh, museums are intimidating. The guards, even our guards, we've been trying to train. But it's just museums, it's, it, it's a space. You've got it, you know, there, there is this kind of regimen. And how do we now make a, a cultural institution accessible? So that's something we, we have a new uh, head of our, our arts and cultural development. And how do we make the institution, it's not just about the art. And it's also no longer just about the art hanging on the wall. It's, we also now currently have an augmented reality exhibition uh, that it's outside. And we're seeing a lot of young kids, families here, using their uh, phones or, 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 or gadgets. So, so that's another thing we, as an institution, has to um, think about, is not just the art on the wall, but also the educational. Uh, make it into context. How do you make sure that? people, this, this generation of Hong Kong kids, uh, I don't think that's a problem in China, right? Because the institution is so new, you, they run around in museums. Uh, you may not want them as a curator or, or, or as an art administrator. Uh, and, and I think in some ways, Dai Gun, uh, that's great to see that kind of number. Nowhere would you, you, know, you go to the Met, I'm not sure they're going to like it. Met or MoMA are going to like it when you have all these people running around, the kids running around uh, in it. But here, that's one of our mission is to make sure that we make art um, not just art, if those of you who know that a lot of our programming is also um, uh, other than art, arts and culture. So, but it is really making things accessible. And so that when they're five or six come, the other day I saw a kid, the father brought the kid in with a scooter. I loved it. You, you, we have a wonderful roof garden. That kid can run around in a scooter. As long as she doesn't hurt anyone or herself, I'm fine with that. Yes, and uh, yeah, I totally agree. And I think like uh, 
to education to educate the 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 audience and to enlarge audience very culture that 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 that's like a major collaborative uh, collaboration for among the all the institutions here but maybe i can play a devil a little, little, little bit we're talking about the, the audience we have the, the education but uh, so after we have another if 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 show about how much museum should charge and uh, that's very important. I think uh, we as long as M, M plus open, we have uh, 16,000 square meters for the exhibition. Among them, two thirds will open, uh, will show our collection there. Another one third we are doing the um, temporary show. So how much shall we charge? Uh, for, for sure, the collection we will not charge. I, I think that that's more like a if that's the taxpayer's money, we cannot charge again for the taxpayer to see the work. But oh, <laughs> don't say but it's about how much we, we should charge. If we want to make a big, nice blockbuster show, you have to invest money there. But if we see, I looked at the six years ago when Andy Offer show here, they have, have like a 200,000 uh, 200, audience there, and they charge around, the, I don't remember, 40 or 50. At the offer show at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Robert. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will give it to you first. So my question about if you only like most of the at the the public museum here, if you only charge like twenty Hong Hong Kong dollar, fifty Hong Kong do, do, dollar, ten. Oh? Ten. Yeah. That's, that, that's really non sub sustainable way. The ten dollars only function for ten dollars is to refuse the domestic helper to come into the, muse the, the, the museum. If you really want to give a nice show for the community here, you have to charge. You have to charge like around 200. But is this the part, part, part possible? Will that be some way for our institution can collaborate? I, I mean, I, I just, I mean, we saw the wonderful Long Museum here. And, um, and the Long Museum is charging 250 200 RMB, which I think is perverse. I'm sorry to have a public museum. Not it's it's a private it's a private museum, but still, you know, I mean, 250 RMB in China is like 500 RMB in Hong Kong, and that is just uh, it's like 500. It's a lot of money, and I think it's too much money, and I totally think it's it's totally over the top. Hong Kong, we have unfortunately, and I had a huge fight with the jockey clubs the last three months. So I know every I know every entrance fee in this town. Hong Kong, Hong Kong has never charged. Hong Kong has never charged for a contemporary or modern art exhibition higher than ten or twenty um, ten or twenty um, Hong Kong dollars. These ten or twenty Hong Kong dollars are only the normal charges the museums take. The reason for that is because the jockey club, which I work for and who pays my bills, um, is is supporting all the big exhibitions and the jockey club insists on a non-charging um, policy which makes my life because i have a big blockbuster coming up and that's why i had that big fight um, no made it almost impossible um to charge we now decided actually on the charging model but it's i couldn't go higher than 50 hong kong dollars which is ridiculous for a blockbuster which should be a hundred dollars and it, and it makes again it makes um it makes um, M Plus's life really difficult talking about com um, communication because why do I charge whatever um, sixty dollar for a big big blockbuster? How can they then argue we want two hundred fifty, uh, two hundred or one hundred fifty dollars? So that's also about talking about co collaboration. I'm completely for museums and collections and so on have to be free, and I only have these amazing numbers certainly because I'm free. The minute you charge even ten dollars, you lose fifty percent of your audience. It's very. It doesn't matter if you charge ten or hundred; you lose fifty percent. Um, but talking about collaboration again, we, we also in most countries we have a museum pass which you you get in. Um, we don't. We are not there yet because I don't think we ever get there with LCSD. Um, and so the, the structures in Hong Kong are quite quite unique also, right? Well, with with Jockey Club, LCSD. But I think at Binhevenas we could charge. Um, because in our agreement with the government, we could charge, um, but we choose not to whenever there is a sponsorship. And, and I'm, I'm of two minds about this. As an art consumer, um, I think you should charge. If you don't charge, you cheapen. Why shouldn't art? I mean, you go to the Met, 
they charge. And even now, the, some of the debates we're talking about, the Met has just changed their rules recently. Uh, as of, of March this year, if, you're, if you have a Hong, uh, ID card, New York ID card, you don't, uh, you don't pay. And students, you don't pay. And but then out of state, you pay. So, so there are ways. So this is something that I think because of China, like again, uh, you're right. There is no uniformity about what you know, private museum, public museum. So I think we, this is things that we also have to look at the local audience. If they're not used to paying, um, you know, so it, it, it's supply and demand. So those, there's no clear cut answers, but we, we choose not to charge uh, uh, for, for our shows, thanks to Jockey Club and others. But there are times we have to charge. Uh, and then, but then there's also creative ways to make money. Uh, thanks to Mr. Nara, uh, Yoshitomo Nara, he knew we had a problem. Uh, we, I think we, we could not charge because Jockey Club, Jockey Club paid for it. And, but Jockey Club also has sometimes have really interesting rules about uh, marketing. Um, they were going to deduct from our, the budget they gave us. And so like, we have no dollar for, for, for marketing. But Nara-san, I love that guy designed a set of plates for us. And those of you who know that the place now is auctioning, people are buying that, you know, he designed it for us to help us do some fundraising that way. So there are creative ways to address that question. And Hong Kong is very commercial. So is China, right? Designing, and, and, and I also see it in Taiwan. So there are ways to address that issue about charge or not to charge. But ultimately, I want you guys to know, it costs money to put together a show. And if we don't get a sponsor, and we don't sell the products, and if we don't, uh, we can't put together a show. And, and we don't make money. I, I'm sure all of us agree. And, but this is different in China, though. People open private museums. They see museum as a commercial enterprise. And even US, you now have the spy museum. Uh, there are a lot of museum shows that are commercial. I think the Harry Potter shows makes a lot of money. I was in the States recently, in New York. They had the Downton Abbey show. I paid $35, $35 to go see a Downton Abbey. It's a commercial show, right? So, so I think there are different models of it. And we have to figure out, according to our institution and according to our ecology, to see to charge or not to charge. I think that's a great um, kind of segue into the book a bit, because here in Hong Kong in 2018, we're hearing LCSD, Jockey Club, West Kowloon, right? I mean, this is floating in the background. And for an audience who may not be familiar with Hong Kong, what are we talking about, right? We are talking about kind of the institutional frameworks of the political economy in particular. So we know that since 2000s, creative industries has been the hot topic. Since Richard Florida, an economist, wrote a book about the creative class, creative industries was a huge thing. Even in Hong Kong, I came here um, around 2008. So perhaps each of you can talk now a little bit. Um, we're going bigger and bigger um, about the particular institutional frameworks that support your institutions in Hong Kong. Um, we also mentioned private versus public, um, not only in terms of the audience, but in terms of um, the funding, right? So in particular, for example, Pili, you've worked actively in Beijing. The institutional frameworks are extremely different in China. Um, in the other countries, the US, for example, or in Korea, where uh, Tobias, you have been, can you speak a little bit, perhaps, to, because this is something that really is very much part of the book, about the museums, the future of museums in China. And for about one point, I don't know how many billion people, this is coming, right? So um, how, how do the local um, institutional frameworks support, um, I guess, uh, condone, uh, frame your collaborations and also your unique institutions? In Hong Kong, we heard about West Kowloon, for example, Jockey Club, um, the AAA. I mean, I mean, that we, please, we, I mean, it's the Jockey Club is a very complicated and multifaceted institution, as we all know, and I know every day. Um, but there is one arm for the Jockey Club um, that gives money to other institutions. Um, that's really completely different to what I'm working in. I'm working basically in a company that is founded and owned by the Jockey Club and run um, not independently from it, but um, 
Um, I have nothing to do with their funding. I, have, I don't even understand how they fund. If people ask me, I don't know the people who are doing that or something like that. That's really very, very different. And I'm, I'm our, our institution and the, the, the framework on that, of that institution is basically happened by mistake. The Jockey Club in originally wanted to outsource the artistic operation of Daigoon to different organizations. We know that AAA had applied, Parasite had applied, different institutions had applied. Um, there were three, um, in the end, there were three um, applications. None of them passed the selection committee, and that's why they got stuck with the cultural institution um, with all its consequences, and we saw one of them um, a weekend ago. Um, so, um, so that's very different, and that's why I'm also Again, what I said in the beginning, I have to cooperate. I'm not allowed to do my own exhibition. Originally, what the, the Jockey Club actually believed that there would be that building, what you know as a gallery building, and we would just give the key to one institution after the other. So Alice, you want to show, do a show, here's a key. Two months later, you give the key back, and you, in between, you do the show, but you have to pay for that. You know, Okay, and then Parasite, and then whatever, MoMA, and so on. Um, that, that certainly doesn't work, because why would Alice do an exhibition in our space for a lot of money when she has a great space herself, or MoMA, or something like that, became... No, it took a lot of convincing in the Jockey Club to make that clear. So, um, so but this, again, my collaboration, pro it has a lot of advantages, but it's also a lot of work. It takes a lot of resources. Um, we are very lucky with resources, um, so it's, this is not the main... Um, Problem, but um, what we do enjoy is that if if M plus or AA or now just Parasite last three days come in and use our facilities, and um, to you you know to do something or when like last week um, people came to um, Asia Society and so on, and I think that's a great thing that we share resources that we share. In in New York, the new museum would never go to MoMA and say, "Can we use your auditorium?" Right? Or it would it would just not happen. But here, it's completely okay for me as Dagon Contemporary to give um, to give other people our our spaces, and it's great for Alice. And I know it's just that different spirit here, and it's also because we know we don't lose patronage or we don't lose image or anything by being co collaborative. And I think that's again the Hong Kong um, possibility. Yep. Oh, sorry. Well, I think to the question of funding, um, one thing that, um, I mean, I can say that A is, a, is um, smaller as in terms of a budget, I think, than you know, either Daigoon or in terms of operations. Well, I mean, in terms of, <laughs> I mean, we don't. You're smaller, I mean, Daigoon is small, uh, whatever. You yeah, see, yeah. I think Daigoon Contemporary as an art entity is actually smaller. I mean, we have 12 people here. Both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we don't have the grounds, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you don't have, have the grounds, yeah. It's, a diff it's totally different. Your research, education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that in that sense, you know, the the funding is also different. I mean, we don't have it's mostly privately funded, so you know, um, our annual fundraiser is responsible for a lot of our annual budget, and part of the uh, the remainder of the budget basically comes from a mix of foundational, private foundational giving, and also some governmental support, um, and. What that has certain kind of, that comes with certain constraints. I, we work with a jockey club, for instance, uh, who funds um, some of our research projects. Um, and they have very specific requirements, um, even for, <laughs> for um, third party uh, donees. Um, but I think one of the things that's good about these kind of conversations uh, with the sources of support is that it kind of keeps us grounded and it makes us kind of responsive and aware of what other people's expectations are. Um, I'm saying this because I, I you know, come from an, uh, an environment uh, which I had really enjoyed, you know, working at the Getty, partly because there is no um, pressure to raise funds. You know, the Getty is one of those uh, really fortunate organizations that essentially self funds for everything and has since you know J. Paul Getty passed away and left most of his oil money to to the Getty, right? Um, but one of the things that you know resulted from that is that the Getty. Um, you know, because it self-funds and because it has its own way of doing things, it essentially kind of doesn't always understand that there are other people with other perspectives and that, it, you know, kind of maybe just kind of assumes that its way of doing things is the way of doing things, you know. Um, and so when you do have to have these conversations with outside parties, I think it makes you more grounded at the very least. Um, 
And so that's been interesting. And I have to say that you know, I, one of the things that has been very um, gratifying about Hong Kong as an environment is I feel like people are very supportive, at least of AA they are, without necessarily making these kinds of demands that, you know, like I feel like um, philanthropy as a, as a kind of activity in the United States is becoming this thing which is almost kind of like you give me this and then I get this in return. And in Hong Kong, at least, I don't quite feel like it's that yet. Um, I think I want to echo what John said, too, about um, you know uh, giving. I think sometimes also people think we were founded by John D. Rockefeller, especially I have to explain this to our Chinese friends, that Rockefellers are still funding us. Uh, no. Um, we at Asia Society, all the centers have to be self-funded, and we pay a fee to New York. So, so you guys have the Getty name. We have the Rockefeller name, but we have to explain everything we do, we have to fundraise. And in some ways, that means you listen to on the ground more. And, and that, that's really important. That means you can really kind of do shows uh, and do programs that are really um, uh, kind of creative. I mean, without money, you kind of have to, and you kind of have to collaborate. So I think that's, that's really important to, um, to stress. And, um, and, and, and yeah, that's my point. But there was something else I, was, I forgot. But, but I think it's really important that we continue, we kind of learn from, oh, China. Um, it's the, the China side of it. Again, it's, it's so commercial. I think it's China is such a new way of doing things. They look at things, everything commercially. So sometimes there are institutions we work with. So, well, why can't you do this? You do that. And it's like, but we're, we, we are an educational nonprofit. And so trying to explain some of this to a, a place like a Chinese, saying, well, you guys were founded by Rockefellers. Why can't you do this? I mean, they, they see money and, and they see there, there's more of a for profit trying to explain a new nonprofit model like what we have is really difficult when we are communicating with Chinese donors. Um, it is more quid pro quo. And somebody says, well, I'm going to give you this. You give me that. So what we end up doing is say, well, we have the hall. That's one way of us offering that alternative. You can't, I, I, you just can't buy a show. We, it's not like, here's a key. <laughs> Chantel Mella Gallery is here. No, we, yeah. we co-curate. But the hall, on the other hand, we can work with you and, you know, on, on a commercial basis. I, I want to just also bring it down again. I mean, we also should not forget that um, both most of uh, two of the most important institutions in Hong Kong, AA and Parasite, are mainly supported by artists that give works for the daily auction. Also, that M Plus got a lot, a lot of donations from the local artists and so on. I mean, it's not. They had a budget, and I can say it now because I'm not in there anymore. But um, they, they had a, there was a good, or there is still some money left, I hope, but there is, was a good budget. But also, every, every time there's something bought from a local or another artist, it was about give us more, give us more work, give us. So, so all, all these institutions are heavily, can only exist because of cooperation and, and, and negotiation with, with the artists. So, um, and I think that's also something that grounds us because it also also just puts us, I mean, uh, me not anymore, but when I was doing Parasite but, or something like that. I know you're not doing that. No, no, no. But one of the things, I, I think definitely the artists, but I, my understanding with donors too, the, the supporter, I know from uh, AAA, some of the founder of AAA were also the initial founder of Asia Society Hong Kong. So you, you have that ecosystem of, of, of donors, artists, um, wanting to see an institution. So to be honest with you, if I had my dream, I know um, some of the donor had this thought, I would have loved the AAA and Asia Society. In fact, I think somebody had mentioned that if we had the foresight, you know, some of the same uh, supporter of AAA and Asia Society, why can't we be together in the same room? Yeah. At Daiquan, maybe. <laughs> no way. Just, I know we're just out of time. Just very short. I think talking about the collaboration. I think for, first of all, people should remember that uh, there's still two floors in Plus buildings, which in future will yeah. open to the local institution to come come into one. So, second, our cinema, our we have three cinemas, which we are seeking. We are we are widely collaborated with the local uh, movement RMG and uh, other uh, the institutions that does too. Talking about the founder raising, and, and we still have a lot of we still have a a, a bit acquisition budget there, but we still have to fund the raising. Same like Asia saw. So, 
so so side we are looking for the do donation to work we are looking for the up uh, the money the, the the money donation for our acquisition we also now bring our american friends found the found found Foundation, which American citizen can donate to us, and then we can get a tax refund based on the Article Five 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 Hundred One B. So that's like we are still. I I I I think we are in a position to fundraising, but I also agree that some of our patrons they are in the same time the pay patrons for AAA and the pay patrons for the Asia so Society. So any communication with these pay patrons will benefit all the institution in this re region. Great, thank you very, very much. It was a very exciting talk. We got, everyone got very excited at that, and so um, we have to continue the conversation, of course, in uh, next year. And um, w would you like to say a final word? Um, just to wrap up real quick, thank you again for participating. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and we're really excited to announce that our next um, kind of symposium and conference, our next edition will take place in Chengdu next year at the Jitter Art Museum. So definitely go on our website and keep updated for that. And we'll be really excited to see you all there. Thank you very much for coming. And also books outside if you'd like to pick up a copy. Yeah. Thank you.